Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. How are you feeling? Pretty sore and uncomfortable. I can imagine. It's all healing, so. Um, uh, I didn't realise I the um there doesn't the there wasn't an event for this meeting and the the events for um the other meeting are on the 043 channel so I'm a bit confused. Of course, because we're a week late, aren't we? Yeah, I'm quite confused about which Zooms we're using for what at the moment. Um, uh, so I'm just trying to sort that out. Okay. Just I'll, run, I'll run my slides from here. Yeah. So are we doing monthly meet? It looks like we're doing monthly meetings on 5608 and the weekly meetings on 043 in the event. That's right, yes. Is that right? Oh, okay. I know we used to do them on the same, but um, I had to reset them up for this meeting for some reason. I can't remember why. So we, uh, we had to use a different uh, number. Okay. Yeah, I haven't really been checking my emails this week. I've just been sleeping. No. I'm a bit out of, uh, just a little bit baffled by everything. <laughs> it's been a peculiar week here as well. I saw, I, I checked the thread this morning, just before I came in, the, about the, um, the Aspergillosis Trust and the fundraising and- Yeah. Looks like a little bit of confusion. <laughs> Well, we, we, we're going to have a meeting about it, so that's quite good. Because uh, okay. I didn't realise that. I didn't even know that was on the cards. That seems... No, no. That was uh, not something I was involved with. So. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of work for them. It is. Uh, I wonder if... It, was... it will be. So um, uh, it would be interesting to see how, it, how successful it gets. That would be good if they can do all the... I've been uh, asking to do. Ah, found my slides. Essentially, I just have moved over most stuff from um, the BBC website this morning. So, <laughs> but the, it doesn't help that certain government ministers are giving out information on Radio Four this morning that that um, doesn't match with some of the data I've got. So uh, they might be looking at something a bit more recent. However. Um, Big increase in the new in the new Delta virus this this yeah. week. Well, the figures this week, which are for last week, so that is a point of concern. Yeah, and just it's not like a two-day blip or anything. It's well, it was. Um, I think we've doubled up to last week. It had doubled to about twelve thousand. Yeah, and then um, the latest figures are like. 30,000, so it, it's gone up a lot. Oh, well, I'm already isolating, so <laughs> I'm not going to be doing anything different. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Beth. How are you doing? Yeah, all right. You've got the recording going and everything. That's good. Cool. Oh, I think it started recording when I logged in. Ah, right. Okay. Um, it's I'll try and stream it into uh, the Facebook group then. Um, group. Lauren, could you possibly send a message out on Hospify that it's in a, I think. Yeah, I've just done it about oh. 10 minutes ago. Oh, cool, thanks. Thank you. 
Microsoft Edge keeps interfering with stuff that I'm doing. And I don't want it to. Microsoft is so pushy. This is always the moment when you, when you think no one's coming. With two minutes to go. I, I hadn't realized it. it it's been confusing. Yes. yes, we've been confusing. Oh, you're very, very distorted, Graham. I seem to be getting feedback. What's going on? I started as soon as I went into Facebook. I'm trying to post in Facebook to um, a reminder that it's happening, but it the um... I, have, I have I have done it. Uh, just see, uh, yeah, again, I've, I've, about five, about five, to, yeah, about five minutes ago. Oh, awesome! Uh, and on well, Twitter. The, the box yeah. for write the post isn't showing up on mine. Is it not? I don't know why. Maybe if I go and get the headphones, it might help. I've gone off Facebook for a moment because it was causing all sorts of problems then. You are, we can see you. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? doing? It's fine. Thank fine, you. yeah. Good. Oh, you've gone to live stream again. Is everything working? Good from my side. It's working here. Yeah. Are we on Facebook? It's like being mission control, this is. <laughs> I'm really glad we're not trying to like land a plane because... I was just about to say something similar, Beth. <laughs> Can we do that thing where we go? We go, flights, go. <laughs> Live, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to share your screen, say, I'm going to need priority. Ooh, I always give you priority. Where, where do we do that? <laughs> okay, I think we'll make a start at five past and see. I'm not I'm not seeing a priority setting. Oh, no, no, sorry, that was just an aeroplane joke. 
Sorry. See, it's a good job we're not flying any airplanes, isn't it? Oh, no, yeah. We'd, we'd, it'd, be, it'd be quite safe. We'd never get off the ground. Well, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So I don't see us in the group. So shall I try and go? It says there's a live stream working. So where's the, where's the live stream going? I'm just going to have a look for it now. <coughs> How is everyone? Very well. Bearing up in this intense heat that I keep getting complaints about. No, it's hot. It's not hot, is it? It's not too bad. Oh, I, I get, not I'm getting. Good at night. Yes, it's mainly at night I'm getting the complaints. Um, I, I have offered to buy air conditioning. <laughs> you might have to go and sleep in the car. <laughs> in the garden, on a bench. I've got a brilliant fan. My uh, husband just moans about the noise it makes at night, but it's just, just the job. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Sheila. Hello. Sheila. Hello. My problem's logging in. What was your, what was your issue, Sheila? Just, uh... It just said the host was in another meeting. So Jill sent me the link and I joined via the link. Check all the links, they are the same. She said um, she said she thinks there is a meet uh, there is a problem. Because is she normally on here? She was she was on yesterday, but yeah. it's, it's a different link for this meeting. It, it is up in the group now, so hopefully anyone who's having an issue, it's not put up as an announcement. So anyone, okay, cool. And it is, in, it is correct in hospital, right? We've moved on to the new hostel file, but it doesn't seem to give you any yes. um, notifications. I've got notifications turned on, but before it used to sort of ping or whatever, and it doesn't do that anymore. Oh, let me uh, let me have a look if there's been any issues reported with it. It might be that you've got to switch them back on in your notification settings with it being a new app. It might not automatically have kind of triggered the notification settings. Mm. I'll have yeah. another look, but I thought I had. Oh, there's a new uh, version come out, hasn't there? Yeah. 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 Do you need a code to add into it like we did on the last one? No, no, it should all it'll all just transfer over once you've once you've put the new the new app on. Right, because I can't do it either. I'll have another go. Okay. <coughs> Where is everyone? Okay, shall we make a little start? Absolutely. Okay, so um, welcome to the slightly postponed Zoom meeting. Um, I'm not really here. I just have to <laughs> her out, so I'm not technically up, meant to be here, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, we didn't do it last weekend because I was anaesthetised. <laughs> you wouldn't have liked, I wasn't making any sense by this time. Um, it's, I still think that's a thin excuse. <laughs> I'll do better. <laughs> okay, so um, today we are going to have a bit of a COVID update because probably everyone's aware that the numbers are going up. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, barometry. The, where's that background noise coming from? Dripping going on. Shall I mute everybody? Uh, oh, it's gone. It was Celia. I've just oh, muted okay. Celia. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I'm going to talk a bit about spirometry because um, the European Lung Foundation have um, re quite recently published some results. They did a big survey finding out um, what patients, what level, people's level of understanding is about.
about it. And um, th there's a lot of gaps in understanding, basically. Um, and then if there's any news notices, I don't know. I don't, I'm out of the loop this week. Have has, the, has the newsletter gone out this, for this month? Or will we wait, has that happened later? Have you written your bio for it? No. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Is that and what we're I, waiting I for? Okay. Yeah, and Chris Link. Chris's one as well. I've not heard anything from her. Okay, sort that out. And then, uh, yeah. Then. I can't think of any other pressing news. You know, it's quite normal as the weather gets hotter, people tend not to tend to find other things to do than come to this meeting, which is uh, fairly normal. <laughs> That's okay. They can go on the YouTube channel over winter and catch up everything. Yes, else. yes. Okay, shall we start with the COVID? Go! I eat that, that's... Sorry. Well, I'm meeting Christine now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over to me. Right, okay. Um, right, everyone feeling good? You ready? This, this is, this is going to be the normal set of slides just updated, so I'll uh, get on with that. Okay, there you go. Can you see that? Yes. Yep, yeah. okay. So as we all know, there is an ongoing situation with a coronavirus pandemic. Um, before I start with this slide, so I don't forget, um, the government released an update to the, um, the guidelines. Um, which included an update for people who are highly vulnerable. And I've put a, an article on aspergillosis.org that covers that and takes you, has all the links in to take you to the relevant website or the relevant resource um, if you want to find out about that. Essentially what they're saying is um, no need to shield, but carry on protecting yourself with social spacing, face masks, hand washing, avoid crowded rooms, maximize ventilation and that, that kind of thing, specifically for those areas of the country that they've identified as hotspots for this, for the virus at the moment. And more of that now. Assuming that works. Yeah, there we go. So just to start with um, this morning's figures on, on the BBC. We're receiving a lot of information in the media about a third or fourth wave, depending on how you look at it. I would call it a fourth wave. Um, just to get some perspective, uh, back in April, I, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen, we looked at these figures uh, and the figures for total deaths. Uh, total numbers of cases, nearly 4,370,000, running at 3,000 cases per day. The numbers of vaccines that are, have been given by uh, April, which would have been the beginning of April, I guess, and the numbers of people in hospital. And um, the government is using these key, key figures and, and some others to decide whether or not we're going to ha go through their fourth step um, going into complete freedom on the 21st of June. Um, but I, I looked at the BBC uh, this morning and listened to Radio 4, and there's lots of ministers who are um, starting to get concerned. And we'll see here uh, some of the figures of what, what is leading, leading, leading that concern. In April, there were 53 new deaths um, on that day and the number of people in hospital dropped by 115 from a figure of 3,000. But on the left-hand side of the screen is this morning's figures. Everyone's panicking, but total number of deaths, seven, which is a small fraction of what they were in April. So, and you can see from the little uh, graph there that deaths has gone down, 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 and it's pretty much staying level. 
Um, I think the we'll find out in a minute the actual uh, moving average is eight for this week. So it's pretty low. Cases, however, are shooting up. There's this morning 7,400 new cases this morning compared to uh, April, where there were only 3,000 cases. This figure actually dropped to, um, I think it was under 2,000 by by the beginning of last month. Uh, and But you can see from the little graph that number of cases has, has risen significantly in the last week. Importantly, you might remember numbers of people in a hospital. This figure went to about 900 to 950 a couple of weeks ago and was steadily dropping, as you can see from that curve there. But we're seeing a small increase in the last couple of days, which might be linked to the increase in the number of cases. And we're doing pretty well with these vaccines. I remember someone saying, and it might have been Doug, um, what happens when we start giving out lots of the second vaccine doses? What happens to the, the rollout? Um, well, as you can see from the graph, as we've given more um, second doses out, we've had to drop the number of doses that we're, we're giving for first dose. The priority seems to be going over to two doses rather than the first dose. But we've still given a first dose to 41 million people. So um, we're doing quite well, and I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. We talked about this in February um, when we were thinking, are these, what, what are we likely to see when we start using these vaccines? What, what, in, in terms of the, the population dynamics of this, this epidemic? Um, and we, we had learned a reasonable amount for about those vaccines at that point, and we knew that the vaccines were good at reducing symptoms, which is great because fewer people would end up in hospital, reducing deaths, which is self-evident, reducing hospitalizations, which is great because that was going to re that will reduce the pressure on the NHS, um, reducing transmission, so um, therefore reducing this R naught number, which tells us that whether or not the um, uh, pandemic in the UK is rising or falling. And the lower the R0 number the, and the lower the transmission, the more likely that the pandemic is going to mm -hmm. uh, reduce. And it has reduced massively in the last three months. Here it is. Yeah, I just don't throw this together. There's the exact slide I needed. Um, so there's the, there's the first wave. Um, this is number of cases, and this is last year. And um, we now know that uh, this wave is uh, uh, quite heavily underestimated, the number of um, infections that there were at that time, because we didn't have great testing at that time. Here's the second wave, which we encountered at the end of last year. And we'd just beaten that in early December when along came the new variant, which was the Kent variant, mm -hmm. which I think is now called Alpha because we don't want to pick on the people of Kent anymore with the name of our virus. Um, and that peaked with a lockdown and uh, with um, giving out the vaccines. And that was a very sharp fall in the number of cases, which has been maintained all the way, all the way until the end of May. And then in the last few weeks, first week or two of June, we've seen this upturn. So the thing we're most concerned about is that upturn, the beginning of another wave, rather like this upturn was, or, or, or this upturn. So I'll be concerned. Go back to February again. We might be remember these maps of the UK. And there's a scale for the pale blue is low Deep red is very high numbers of cases in all the regions of the UK. And I think these are, um, so this is Cheshire East and that's Cheshire West and Manchester's in the middle there somewhere. Uh, and you can see the darker colors are quite widespread. We've even got some deep reds in this area. If I was actually on the website, I'd be able to click on that and tell you exactly where it is, but I'm not. So um, 
you can access all of this information on the BBC coronavirus pages. There's just a simple single page and you scroll down and you'll be able to get to this map. I think it's bbc.co.uk forward slash coronavirus. And there's a clear link at the top of the page. So lots of virus around in February, which we knew. Uh, then moving forward, whoops, to April, the same scale, you can see there's a huge drop in the numbers. Things were all going in the right direction. Um, and I think we said last um, month that we had no concerns over uh, the, um, the direction of this uh, pandemic. However, uh, as of this morning, we're seeing this. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, this was just a, a small darker spot around Manchester Bolton. I think that's Bedford and they're having issues up in Glasgow, but you can see the colors spreading out now. Um, they're, they're, they're pushing down on the number of cases in the Bolton area. And I believe the, the cases in that area have peaked and are falling. Similarly for uh, Bedford down here, but you can clearly see um, cases are spreading throughout the UK, uh, which is a, a concern. Although still arguably nowhere near that. So um, we're concerned now, um, but of course, this um, is a case where something like two thirds of us have already been vaccinated, whereas this was a case where almost nobody had been vaccinated. So we're hoping to improve on that and not get as bad as that um, in our next map. So we'll see how that turns out, but let's look at some other evidence of the way things are going. Um, here is the um, this morning's new figures on uh, viral spread. Oh, actually, what it is is the number of cases that they've detected of the different variants of COVID. So right at the top, this is the Kent variant, now called Alpha. And that's the one that caused all the trouble this winter and caused the third wave with its enhanced transmission. So... Um, 260, nearly 268,000 cases of that. And the last week they had about 9,000 cases re recorded. Um, but you can remember, we've been watching this Delta variant. Uh, two, uh, four or five weeks ago, we were seeing that go from 250 to 500. Uh, and last week it went from about 6,000 to about 12, 13,000. Uh, but there's been an enormous increase this week, 29,000, near 30,000 new cases of um, the Delta variant, which is why it's now becoming significant, a significant concern. And we're getting lots more comments about it on TV from government ministers. It's almost completely taken over from the Alpha variant. And um, there's, a, there's a fair number of cases there uh, as well. So again, that's not good news. Um, we, we, we didn't want to see that happening with a variant. This is where the Delta variant has been detected and it's very similar to that map I just showed you in, in that the hotspots are around the greater Manchester area. And I think Lauren said earlier on that um, we've just heard that there are new controls coming in for greater Manchester. Have you got a summary of that? To, uh, that is correct, and I do have a summary of it with me one second. Sorry to just drop that on you there. That's, that's not a problem. I have a summary of it. No, your, your mic's a little bit distorted as well. Uh, Maybe a bit loud. That, it's because I'm a scouser. <laughs> it's not an excuse. <laughs> but it might better? be a reason. <laughs> is, is, is that better? It's getting better. I'm used to talking in shouty tones to my children, that's why. <laughs> so, there has been a, a rise in the Delta variant in the Greater Manchester area. So it's now been designated as an enhanced response area due to this rise. So the government has announced a strengthened package of support for, for us over this way. And that's going to include more vaccine supply, military support if we need it to help open up additional centres and further support around COVID testing and tracing and we're hoping that it's going to start from the end of this week. The national guidance has also changed a little bit for people in the Greater Manchester area and the advice is now is 
take extra care and meet people outside rather than inside. Again, it's only guidance. It's not it's not like last year when we went into uh, local lockdowns, which is one of the things they're really trying to emphasise. Uh, obviously, they want people to continue to follow the guidance around social distancing, face coverings, washing hands. Uh, they want they're encouraging people to do the self the self test and twice weekly, which obviously is available in case anyone doesn't know for your, your local pharmacist, you can pick up your packs from there. And obviously, just you know, if anyone's got any symptoms, they're saying please go and get a PCR test. So they're kind of ramping up the surge testing as well. So yeah, that's in this area at the moment. And okay. this and attention, but there has been also been a, an increase in hospital admissions in the Greater Manchester area at MFT, which obviously is just a little bit worrying, and we'd like to see that under control as soon as possible. Yeah. So um, again, it doesn't it just doesn't sound great? They're putting in more resources to try and control that uh, spread. I would I would um, say the peak of this is going to be limited because. Um, we're most many more of us are um, protected, but it's still um, it's a concern for all that for, for it flowing through the population and the potential for new variants is something that they're worrying about a lot. Oops, I can actually actually if I move this over here, can you can you see that website there or not? Yes. Can you see that? Okay. This is the um, article on aspergillosis.org, yeah. which is the update from the UK government, which went out three, three or four days ago. And these are the areas that they've described. Um, if you live in these areas, you need to um, show greater awareness uh, and, and protect yourself a little more. So we've got Bedford, uh, Blackburn with Darwin, uh, the Greater Manchester Combined Authorities, so that's Bolton, Bury, Manchester, Oldham, Rochdale, Salford, Stockport, Tameside, Trafford and Wigan. I assume that means us in MFT as, here as well, Widdenshaw. Um, Kirklees, Lancashire, so Burnley, Chorley, Fylde, Hindburn, Lancaster, Pendle, Preston, Ribble, Ribble Valley, Rossendale, South Ribble, West Lancashire and Wire, uh, Leicester, one part of London and um, North Tyneside. Um, and uh, on that page, it, it tells you the, the um, slightly enhanced precautions that you should be taking, very much like we've had during the earlier uh, wave of infections to protect yourself. And there is actually a specific um, couple of uh, paragraphs if you are clinically extremely vulnerable so if you've had one of those letters telling you that you're clinically extremely vulnerable, <coughs> it, it applies to you um, you are no longer advised to shield however you should continue to follow follow the guides for people who are clinically extremely vulnerable advised to continue to take extra precautions to protect yourself such as limiting close contact shopping or traveling at quieter times of the day keeping rooms ventilated and washing your hands regularly your employer is required to take steps to reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace. So pretty much as they were before, and this is on top of the precautions that um, Lauren's just been talking about. And they're still asking you to be careful if you've been vaccinated, even though you are much better protected, um, they're not taking any risks because you could get infected and not experience any symptoms and still be transmitting the virus. So that, that you can go and Look at that more in more detail on aspergillosis.org uh, later. Right, so we're doing well with vaccinations. This is what we have to do now. We're in a race against this variant. The variant is mostly, I think it's 95% infecting people who haven't been vaccinated. But as you can see from here, uh, 41 million uh, people have had their first dose. We need to get to 53 to cover all of the adults in the country, which is essentially all the people who might be at risk. And we're up to nearly 29 million um, with the second dose. The target is to have the first dose given out to everybody by the end of July, which will give significant protection 
although we we know from uh, what's been said before that really you really you need two doses to be fully protected against this particular delta variant so um, I don't know, has everybody here had two doses? I assume you all have. So you're pretty well protected from this, but nonetheless, it's worth paying attention to these um, regional figures that we've got as if you live in the Manchester or Bedford areas. Incidentally, Scotland is also pretty poor. There's lots of cases in Scotland and that map didn't, I don't, did that map show that? No, it cut it off. Um, but I think I've got a map a bit later that shows you that. Uh, data a bit later that shows you that. Um, interestingly, um, there's a study that's been happening, as you can see, if you look at this list, since the 7th of December last year, every week they've been sampling blood of five to 8,000 people. In fact, more than that recently, up to 20, 23,000 people. And they're looking for antibodies to COVID in their blood. So we can survey the whole general population of the UK to see how much protection that we're likely to have from COVID. Of course, antibodies are only one sign of our protection uh, and are liable to reduce in time. But we have several layers to our defense that are triggered by these vaccinations, one being something called T cell um, resistance. And that there's been recent data I read only yesterday that shows that that's having a very significant effect, possibly more so than these antibodies. But this is just a guideline. Um, you will only have these antibodies if you've been infected or if you've been vaccinated. So right at the start, we just need to look at these two columns at the end. <clears throat> um, they found 434 people who, who had antibodies out of over 5,000 they tested. So somewhat less than 10% back at the beginning of December, uh, which is about the level of viral infection back then. Uh, move forward to this, ooh, what's that? The week before last, you're looking at nearly 19,000 people out of 23,000 have antibodies to COVID. And this is the effect of the vaccination and a also the effect of infection, but vaccination primarily. In excess of 80% of us are now protected from this virus. So that is what's going to limit this outbreak. It's not going to be hit the peaks that we saw over Christmas. Um, this, these antibodies will suppress that peak significantly. The big question is, will they suppress that peak to not put pressure on the NHS? And at the moment, there's a certain amount of doubt a certain amount of unknown about that i should say i would say yes quite quite comfortably we won't get anywhere near um here we go we won't get anywhere near this number nearly forty thousand people uh, in hospital which was over chris what was that january christmas time something like that and currently 1048 uh, patients i think it's a little bit less than that this morning um, and you can see it's dropped and it's quite fairly steady at the moment. But as we know, if um, once the number of cases start to rise, the number of people in hospital takes a week or two before those figures come through. I think we're going to be, we, we'll see rises here, but we're not going to see this sort of rise or anywhere near this sort of rise. Um, but uh, time will tell. So, uh, and more, more reason to, to be careful when, you, when you're when you coming into contact with this virus or people who may have these viruses. Uh, hospital cases regionally, uh, London is just starting to tick up, but still fairly low levels. Midlands, fine. Southeast, all right. East of England, gradual increase perhaps. Northwest, and there, there we see a clear increase. So we... Our cells here in MFT seem to be sitting in the uh, epicenter of this particular outbreak at the moment. Yorkshire, not so much. Southwest, fine. Wales, fine, maybe a little bit. Scotland is the other area, though there seem to be fairly steady increase in numbers um, going on. Northern Ireland looks fine. So regionally, um, just um, check to see where you are and what your risk might be. Deaths. 
still really low. So if we go back to the um, slide at the start, what are the expected signs of the virus? We might see quite a few cases. That's what we're beginning to see. But we shouldn't see so many hospital cases because the symptoms are much lower. That's still consistent with what we're seeing. And we should see a lot fewer deaths. And that's still exactly what we're seeing. Albeit these, this is probably not likely to uptick because of the increased cases yet for another week or two, which is why the government wanted to wait two weeks before uh, they want to do their, um, their easing up on, on restrictions. So mixed, it's a bit of a mixed um, picture, but I'm relatively optimistic um, that um, this is going to be another stage to the recovery from this virus. Uh, this group of people needs to be aware and take be, be cautious, uh, especially when going out. And in particular here, one bit of data I've got, which I can't find the actual figures for, but which was talked about um, on the internet, uh, when, on Radio 4 when I was going home, is that um, a lot of these new cases are in children. Um, schools are starting to see quite, quite extensive numbers of cases, especially around the age 7 to 11. So if you are uh, potentially coming into contact with this age group of children, you should bear in mind that there's a very good chance. Well, there's not a very good chance. It's still a small chance. But uh, potentially, um, that's a group that is higher than most people um, with the virus. So be careful. Um, the hospital cases have also been reported to um, be much younger people. It's very few people who, who were in the original sort of 50 plus high vulnerability, which is exactly what we hoped the, the vaccines would do. And they seem to be doing that still. Um, and the cases are less severe. Although a minister on TV this morning said that um, uh, the, the new variant is causing more cases, it's more highly transmissible, which we know from these figures. Um, but it, and he said it's causing more severe symptoms in hospital. Uh, but I can't find anything to back that up at the moment. But just to make you aware um, that that's what they said this morning. Deaths are still stable. Interestingly, abroad, which is how I uh, ended the last talk, if you look, this, this whole virus outbreak is not going to be beat if we don't pay attention to what's happening overseas. And um, back in um, April, the globally, the numbers of cases and the numbers of deaths was going up quite steeply. I'm happy to say that that has peaked and is now coming down um, relatively steeply as well globally. So the long-term picture coming from other countries um, is potentially optimistic, though I have to say, I don't think they've seen the, the Delta virus yet. So they may be coming down from their third peak, just like we did in, in the spring. And uh, as Delta gets out there, then they may see a, a fourth peak like we're starting to see. We seem to be at the uh, leading the way in, in, in getting these variants for some reason. I think, yes, that's it. Any questions? Stunned. Has everyone got a stock of the uh, lateral flow tests at home? I have. They're quite a good thing to have on hand, like, um, uh, so, well, we have to do them twice a week because we work at the hospital, but like my parents, they got uh, just one box and whenever they're going to see friends and relatives, especially older ones, everyone does a lateral flow test before they get in the car and then they just feel a bit more comfortable. Mm. Oh. I, I've got a pack. Oh yeah. How are you because finding them? I haven't, I haven't done one yet because I haven't been out and about, but I am starting to go out and about a lot more now. And um, I don't know, um, the Neatons had um, a surge testing and, you know, vaccinations. I think we've got 25 cases, that's what they've told us. So I shall be, but that is a brilliant suggestion to, if you are going to 
see a friend to take one then. I'm not sure how many's in the pack, but uh, I'm glad I've got them. And it only took two days, less than two days possibly, to yes. arrive. Yeah. That is an excellent. Free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very <laughs> easy to uh, obtain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've used them a lot because I use them before going to my hospital appointments and then three days later, I'll use them again just to check that everything's clear. So we can tra track if, where we might have picked it up. Yes. And yeah. If we're clear before we go mm. and then you take it a few days later and you've only been there, then yes, that's the only Good place. Idea, yeah. yeah, every time we go somewhere, doctors, dentists, mm. We take them before and then three days later. So, and there's and, seven in the pack. And can I ask, do you have to fill in some details online or something when you take them? Yes, you do. There's number on the test okay. itself. Okay. And it gives you details how to do it in the booklet. Right, thank you. And they're quite handy as well. You know, sometimes you think, oh, I don't know if I feel 100% like... Mm is it worth getting a PCR test or whatever? Um, so like um, over the weekend, after I'd had this thing, um, I had a sore throat and a cough. Mm, mm. And I thought, well, I don't know if that's, have I picked up something at the yeah, hospital yeah. or is it just like that, that happens yeah. if you have a tube down your throat, that's, that's mm. just what happened. Um, so it's quite reassuring if you've just got a box of them and you don't have to think or worry, you can just grab one just for a bit of reassurance. Mm. Mm. Do you order them online? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. Just put in the actual flow test and then it'll give you the details where to get them. You, you can just go to any local pharmacy as well and get, get a box from any local pharmacy. Mm -hmm. yes. for, for, for free, you can just walk, you can just walk in and, and get them. Yeah, that's, yes. that's the, yeah. And they don't go up. Yeah. No, our doctor puts them in our repeat prescriptions for us. Nice. <laughs> that, is, that is such a good, that's such a nice practical idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. They feel gross when they go up your nose. It's a bit of, yeah, might make you sneeze, but yeah, like that. yeah not nice. <laughs> no, <laughs> you wouldn't do them for fun. But. No. I, think, I think the first two I did made me sneeze. But, uh... One question I have is, why don't schools enforce the testing on the children? Well, well in, in, in the school my son's in, they are doing two swabs a week. Yeah, in my grandson's school, they're supposed to do them, but hardly any of them do them. Ah. And they don't report it or anything, and it's not followed up. I, I think there's there's... I've been a problem with with the whole of the test and trace thing is 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 the lack of follow up, mm. um, uh, generally. But I noticed an upturn in in anxiety in the school last week, um, and mm. we've seen, we've now seen the figures that tell us why. So hopefully they'll um, tighten up on that. Mm. Um, but um, I I don't, I don't think that we're going to get we're, we're going to be able to completely eliminate this virus in, in the UK. Um, so we are going to have to live with it a certain level of it. And um, as, as we're only just beginning to experience this Delta virus variant, let's hope that it um, isn't, doesn't, isn't particularly nasty with symptoms. Generally, it's infecting younger people who are more resistant to the whole thing anyway. So it becomes more like um, people have said all along, more like a, a flu than a um, something that get puts you in hospital. Um, but you're right. Um, if we seriously want to contain this, we, we we need to ensure compliance. And maybe that's why they're talking about putting extra manpower uh, in Greater Manchester and probably some other places mm. and enforce that. Yes, because also local businesses around here, I'm going for my first haircut next week, and I said, asked them if they were doing the lateral flow testing. She said no, because if they do it and one of them is positive, they've got to shut the whole salon. So none of them are doing it. Yeah, that's kind of... Well, um, I know big organisations like the police 
and the NHS uh, say um, are not using the um, app on the phone because that that mm -hmm. will give you a mandatory you've got to stay away if it if you shows you've been in contact with somebody and you could shut down the en entire hospitals in a, in a week if we were to mm -hmm. carry on using those what we are doing is doing these 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 lateral flow devices every every twice a week to to keep to monitor those um levels of virus um but yeah yeah, yeah it's a shame that can't be enforced that everyone has to do it because then they would be able to keep proper control on it yeah but, no, but no, um countries that have been able to do that in for example um china and uh south korea um have been very successful at containing it do we you know, do we want the same sort of authoritarian control in the uk i think a lot of people would react against that so i think um we're stuck with <laughs> just having to cope with people who ain't going to cooperate as well as people who are going to cooperate it's it's yes. and, and we're still getting i haven't seen much for recently but i believe there's still a lot of anti-vax um information out there which is not helping at all so no it's not a friend of mine who she works at the hospital she said that in the Bury St Edmunds area there is a lot of people who are anti-vax she said there's an awful lot of the older population who haven't been vaccinated and she said they're causing a problem when they go into the hospital um, um, I find that quite surprising they were, they were the, of the most mm, vulnerable population mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, she said they was they were really surprised, and it just seems to be one particular area. Um, and there's someone looking at the council is actually looking into it because um, they can't work out what's happened in that area. Yeah, so, and, and we I, I put figures up on the Facebook page only yesterday showing that NHS workers in London are still not. Are still miles behind the rest of the country when it comes to being vaccinated and you, you just wonder why mm. well, there was a rumor or somebody said that they were going to make it compulsory for nhs workers uh, well they, they there are different ways of doing it i, I know um for us um the uh flu test is not compulsory but it comes with the rider that if you don't um get the flu test and you become ill then you will not be um uh, you will not qualify for sick pay so there's a diff there's a there are different ways of doing it i guess i don't know if they could enforce that but i've certainly read that i think having I the nurses come around sorry. sorry sorry Beth. carry on I think um, they've they've started clamping down a bit on people not getting the flu jab. They the, the, they come right to your desk now. So like last year, they just sort of sprung out from a corner and were like, right, it's your turn now. Get in the meeting room. So it's quite it. They make it quite awkward to refuse. I I was ambushed. It's good. I I, I was ambushed in somebody's office. I was having a chat, and all of a sudden, I was <laughs> I was getting a vaccination. Yeah. Sometimes they lurk outside the canteen as well, and if they see that you're wearing a staff pass, they just grab you, pull you out. <laughs> yeah, they're like yes. guerrilla tactics. Um, I had just had a news thing flash up on my phone that's saying that the Pfizer and the is it Moderna, I can't pronounce that one. Moderna. Moderna had been showing heart inflammation in younger people, and they're now looking into it. Have you seen anything like that? I've not seen that. Anybody else? No, it's not one that came out. I'm just, yeah. I'm just googling. I'm just googling now. Um, that flashed up. Let's see if I can find it where it was. It just flashed yeah, up on my ask. news, my news feed. I've got an article from. It's coming out of America. So, I've got an article from Ruth heart inflammation in young men higher than expected after Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is coming out of the CDC. Uh, obviously, we're just reading this now, so there's not much that we uh, higher than expected number of young men have experienced heart inflammation after the second dose of Pfizer and Moderna, according to data from two vaccine safety monitoring systems uh, in the CDC. 
other health investigators are investigating. Uh, Israel's reporting there's a likely link to a condition in young men. Uh, still assessing the risk. There's no conclusions been made about the causal relationship between the vaccines and cases of myocarditis or pericarditis, which are inflammation of the heart tissue and then inflammation of the, the heart itself, uh, which is common. Myocarditis is, is something that's been picked up in young men. Uh, yeah, they're still looking into it. There's no clear link been made. It's just initial, it's that initial findings. Uh, 283 observed cases of heart inflammation after second doses in the 16 to 24 age group. Uh, so, so that's, that's not yeah, UK data. continuing to investigate. That's no. US data. No, it's all American. There's, there's, there's nothing coming out of the UK on it at the moment. But that's apparently we are investigating. So. But nothing. That's probably... Nothing. Um, it's probably worth saying, worth mentioning as well. Um, this this um, heart inflammation that is something that you can quite often get following a virus itself. So what we what we need to know is not just um, like when when all the numbers have come out, not just how many people are getting this pericarditis after the vaccine, but how many people are getting it after COVID itself. So um, I was I went on a field trip at university somewhere exotic and we all came back with dengue fever and pericarditis and it, it kind of sounds like a really bad thing but um, a lot of the time you can just um, especially if you're young and fit it's a case of taking ibuprofen for a couple of months um, but a lot of them are quite mild so it'd be, it would be interesting to know what the risk is if you get mm. covid itself. And that's yeah. that. That's an example of a the the similar similar vaccine to the Pfizer vaccine, I think, which is an mRNA vaccine. Whereas the previous problem, the one with um, issues with blood clotting, is the AstraZeneca, which is a completely different type of vaccine. So, mm. um, concerning that, just a quick question on that. My niece had the AstraZeneca. She went away. When she came back, her cough is doubled in size. She went to doctors, they did a D-dimer test, said it was normal, nothing to worry about, go away. Um, should there be follow-up tests to that? The, the reason we have it in the family, it was fatal for my mother and my sister is, she's through the roof with panic. Um, and I said, well, if the dear diamond test has come back normal, I said, maybe I'd do a lung x-ray. I said, she might have been bitten, but she's got no hardness, no, it, a lot of pain, but no redness or bruising, absolutely no, no other symptom apart from the swollen cough and the pain. I mean, if, if sorry, go on, Beth. How long, how long has she had the worst cough for? Is it just been a couple of days, sorry? It's been a couple of days, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, my sister's asked me, because she knows I've had problems in the past, and I said to her, all I can say is go back to the GP, get them to double check, and perhaps do a chest x-ray to see if she's got any blood clots on the lung. I said, but they've done dear dimer, it's clear. I don't know, I don't know what else to advise her apart from going back to the doctors and keep getting it rechecked. Mm. Lovely actually tried to explain this, the symptoms. She went to the doctor. She actually went to the doctor um, and they examined it. And that's when they did the diadema test and things. And they said, because it's come back clear, then that's fine. How, how out of curiosity, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm not medical, but just how old, how old your niece? 33. Is she, uh, is she overweight or anything? No. Because basically what, what they look at as well is in line with the the, the, the D-dimer test is they look at uh, what you call VTE and whether you're at risk of whether you've got the 
predisposition to getting a to get the blood clot. So they look at things like age, if you if you're overweight, uh, if you've done an extended period of being so say if you've done a long haul flight. So they look at all those things as well. I know that that doesn't make you. I suppose I'm just trying to reassure you a little bit in terms of what they're looking at as the bigger picture but obviously if it does continue then she probably does need to go back to a, a gp and mm. get an explanation for why it's like that but they will have also looked at all these kind of boxes that they they check as they as they go along as well but that's more just to reassure you than anything that it, it will be the, the d down the negative d down in line with, with what they're looking at as well but she probably certainly should go back if it if it continues yeah. All right then. Thank you. And if it gets much worse in the night or something, then A and E. Yeah. But and I've told her the other thing to look out for is if she starts getting any tightness or pain in her chest or wheezy, then just go straight to A and E, basically. Yeah. So yeah, they know what to look out for, but you know what these youngsters are like. They think they're fine and. She only mentioned it in passing that she had this swollen leg. All right, then. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go, go and see, get her to go and see a GP again, I think. Mm. Yeah, I will do. I'll phone my sister later and tell her. Um, are they giving the AstraZeneca to the under 30s? Uh, well, no, no. no, they're not giving it to anyone under 40. So if there's a problem with the Pfizer one, regards heart problems or anything then that could cause quite a problem mm. couldn't it yeah. Yeah. well potentially but it seems to be only in men and it yeah. depends on the level of risk compared to the level of risk that they're saving by being vaccinated uh, and then it becomes a, ba a balancing act well we have three vaccines in the UK now do the men have pre-existing heart conditions Graham we don't. We haven't seen the data yet, so I don't know. It's, it, it, it's very. It's it is very limited data at the moment. But there's is, there's only been two hundred and thirty cases, and that's out of the hundred and thirty million that have yeah. of vaccine doses yeah. that have been received yeah. in in the US. So it is a very minute. Just from looking at this initial yeah. report, which I can't see a link to any of the actual data, it's it's very early, and it. You know, yeah. as as Beth said, yeah. it could just be a, it could be the body's inflammatory response to that. Yeah. Anyway, I, I had the AstraZeneca, and um, I had quite an quite a bad response to the first dose. That's all I shall say. But on the second dose, which I was dreading, a tiny, tiny response. So. You know, in my mind, it's a good thing, you know. Um, what else have we got except the vaccinations? You know, I, I, I think for the general person, there is no question that for someone age 50 over, it's an absolute no-brainer. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah um, as yeah. you get younger and younger, it's still, uh, uh, as we start saying 18 to 25, you start to think that's where these other hazards start to play a role. Um, I see. Because they don't really have a large risk of um, bad symptoms from an infection. So they could probably have an infection and not, not worry about it. The purpose of the vaccination is to slow down transmission, mm -hmm. and which is not really, not solely for their benefit. So. It's more of a, I don't know, a public um, uh, health uh, decision. And if you're worried about, I mean, obviously um, your sister, she's already got a concern, but if, you, if you're just maybe a bit worried, like if you know people that are about to have the second vaccination or if you're worried about blood clots, um, there are things you can do to, um, you just make sure that you're taking care of yourself in the best possible way that will reduce your risks. So things like making sure you're hydrated um, and making sure you keep eat just a little bit active. So being sort of sedentary or if you're if you're stuck in bed, like if you, mm -hmm. if you get poorly and you're stuck in bed, um, 
there are sort of excess if you even just very very simple ones um exercises like like the ones that chris does with us sometimes things like that that get your circulation moving a bit yeah. um, can really help and sort of not that's a thought i must go i must go remind chris oh, oh if, she, if she's around if she's no, around, don't yeah. i'm going to remind her <laughs> So, and yeah, um, drinking enough water, um, not just loading up on bacon sandwiches. Like, I know, yeah. I know. It's like sometimes when you pull, all you want is just comfort. But um, but just yeah. like so keep, keep keeping your circulation moving a bit. Like yeah. even so, like um, well, last week I, I had the compression stockings on for two days. They're horrible things, aren't they? Yeah. Elegant. So <laughs> ugly. And it's like wearing plastic bags on your legs. It's, it's so horrible. Yeah. And just like, I just wanted to kind of stay in bed, but they said, no, you have to get up and move. Yeah. You're not being well. Oh, I had my gallbladder out. I'm fine. Oh, right. I but, see. But, yeah, um, yeah, you you yeah. know, they fill you full of air during yes, the surgery. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And you could tell, like, there was a few of us had our gallbladders out at the same time. And you mm. could tell who was, um, like, moving around a bit more. They were burping like crazy. But mm. they got, mm. they were a lot mm. more comfortable. Mm. Um, and there was a woman who, I think she was, she was in a lot more pain than anybody else. And she was she was quite embarrassed about mm, mm, mm. the gross noises and stuff mm, mm, mm. and she wasn't clearing the gas very quickly mm, and mm. she was really suffering um but yeah doing just like a little bit of like a few very very gentle yoga poses yeah the trapped wind. Yeah, I've been... <laughs> yeah and it just keeps you moving okay Yes, yeah. I was quite surprised because yeah. um, I've had naturally yeah. got one car, which is actually bigger than the other one. And they sent, yes, yeah, they sent me for um, a vein test with a specialist in London. And he said, well, he said, the first thing I could say is your calf is bigger than the other one. He said, I'm not happy with that. And then they did all the tests. And if you just move your toes, you could hear and see the blood shooting up and down the vein. Wow. It was really, really weird. And he said, I've just naturally got one calf bigger than the other. Um, but he said, yes, he said, just literally wiggling your toes will make the blood move up and down. So he said, if you are bedridden, you've got the horrible stockings on. He said, you'll find that if you just lay in bed and just wiggle your toes around and move your, your feet, that is enough to get the blood moving up and down your legs yeah because the um, um the, the the way it comes back to your heart like some of the the valves it's the muscles contracting mm. pushes everything back up yeah, yeah it was it's quite interesting it was, yeah but, yeah so when i look down at my calves and think oh that's a bit bigger than the other one i think yes it's, <laughs> it is <laughs> too much hopping probably when i was little I used to hop a lot <laughs> I did say to Chris, Doug, that um, you didn't want her to come and do the exercises. And unfortunately, that's um, no, definitely she's coming now. So uh... <laughs> Deliberate. <laughs> you all grow up. Well, I might have to disappear. <laughs> I want to set for a doctor's appointment, uh, telephone call, so I might disappear. Okay. <laughs> do, we, do we want to have a coffee break or shall I just get on with... Oh, no, you can carry on. Okay, cool. I'll just have a slip. Hang on. <laughs> you, you carry on. I just, um, I'll go off camera for a short moment. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my slide? Uh, not yet. Not yes. Yet. Okay. So um, I thought you might be quite interested to see um, a project that the European Lung Foundation ran. Um, they do, they, if, you, if you've not come across them particularly, they do a lot of really good work um, finding out what patients' needs are and opinions and trying to build that back into um, healthcare and how it's provided. And they did um, a big survey um, and it was called Improving Spirometry Testing by understanding patient preferences, which doesn't give much away, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. So the, the survey itself, it ran in 2018, I think, um, 
but they've they released a report I think last month. Where's my slideshow? Uh, I can't. Um, yeah, they released a report looking at the results and um, what can be done. So it was a big survey. Um, it covered 52 countries. They did it in all different languages. And they got 1,760 people replied, which is just phenomenal. It's really, really nice data set. Um, so what they, one of the, the, the big things that came out of that was a lot of people, they go to this spirometry appointment, they do the test, they don't get told what the result is and they don't know what the, what the numbers even stand for and they don't understand how it, why it's being done and how it's going to affect sort of their treatment or does it mean my disease has got worse or why are you measuring this? Um, in, so one, the, like, one of the main measures is called FEV1, which we'll, we'll, we'll see how many people have heard of that in a minute. So that it's a really important number. And when they looked at different people with different conditions. So this covered all, it was, it was any lung conditions. So not just aspergillosis, but all lung conditions. So they found that cystic fibrosis patients were the relatively quite well informed, like about three quarters of them, they knew what it meant and they knew why, what, what, what um, it meant for their treatment. Um, asthma and COPD patients, lag behind quite a lot. So mm. just under half of them understood what the test was for. And it's quite, um, like obviously not understanding things can feel quite horrible because you don't feel mm. troll, but also it's not necessarily a pleasant test to do as I'm sure some of you will, will, will be able to attest. Um, so most people, most people said, uh, it's all right I can do it but there was about one in eight really found it hard like really really it was difficult and um of those of those people uh, the main problems uh, that they said were moderately or seriously problematic um was um people feeling like they've blown as much as they can blow there's nothing left and the doctor saying you know keep going keep going keep going and there's, they don't feel like there's anything left in there. Um, it makes people cough, which can be really, it, like it, ugh, it's unpleasant. And it can make you quite tired afterwards. And if somebody's already got um, like sort of issues sort of um, at their baseline with breathing, it can be quite scary to think, you know, is this going to make me so short of breath that I'm going to have a problem here? And it can be quite frightening. Um, so has anybody, like, oh, just just quick straw poll. Um, has anybody got any sort of, ex any thoughts or experiences, like when you've been for spirometry, like, do you find it yeah, okay yeah. or is it? I have. I think it depends on which, for me, um, it depended on the hospital. I've had one done locally, um, which is always a nightmare. I'll tell you why if you want to know. But um, but then I went to hospital in Leicester, and it was it was totally totally different. Uh, in that one operator was so clear and concise and patient when you did lose mm. your breath or, or you had to repeat the last step. And, and this stuff at the other hospital got very, very impatient, which makes, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so I can follow the instructions perfectly, but sometimes you can't. Um, carry it out for the length of time that they wish you to be breathing out or whatever the, the exercise is. So you are in there for quite a long time. But for, but for me, I, I got the best reading ever from the, uh, the Leicester Hospital who were, you know, had no problems and I was really quite ill. 
you know and uh, yeah so I think that's that's been my experience I, I think the top I think the top one being told to keep blowing when you felt nothing was coming out yeah I, I've had it I've had a, a couple of tests where which that that sums it up perfectly mm. uh, and I was and the, the, the operator, the person who was doing it on me, got quite aggravated yes. with me at one point. Mm. So, you know, so that I wasn't putting any effort in. I know. Felt like being at school again. Yeah. yeah. I think there is quite a lot of, um, I think doctors do some, when you read things aimed at doctors and written by them, I think they do get quite anxious in just in case somebody's not trying hard enough because mm. it, is it, it, it can affect the results so much. And I think they're quite anxious to make sure it goes, goes right. And they don't always manage that anxiety very well. Uh, and, so, and it sort of spills over onto the patient, which isn't fair. But are they looking at the figures that they are expecting to get, the figures and not the patient's ability? I think it's just really hard to tell. Mm. I think from experience of having quite a few <laughs> tests that it depends on how good the uh, technician is on giving you the, um, the technique of yes. what they want to do. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think I've found when I've produced really, you know, improved results, it's been because the technician has had the knack of explaining exactly what they want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way that didn't cause you anxiety. Yes. 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 And, and most of them, I think most of them are, are given by technicians rather than doctors. Yes. Yeah. So well, I've never had a doctor give me one. No. It's yeah. always been no, a technician. No, me. Yeah. Sometimes it, that's it, what you want though. It's, you know, like when you have blood drawn, it's so much, you can't, you'd rather have the nurse that does it day in, day out, rather yes. than the doctor yes. who's got yes. some fancy yes. degree that can't find a vein. And you're like, oh. See, it would be interesting to survey and, and, and this this actual point, because um, maybe the training of these these technicians isn't, isn't good enough on this point. Mm. You know, we've had trouble with lots of doctors who are, who are, who are uh, concentrating on what they want out of the test rather than on the yes. patient having the test yeah. the ability um, and it is important that they get this is a bit line so that the, they want they need every square cubic centimeter of air out of you each time so yeah. they know you so they because next time you might not do so much so they know whether they've got an improvement or a deterioration yeah it, it, it is quite important but there are ways and means of getting that and clearly with two of you showing saying did depending on two different operators, you've had completely different clinical results. That's actually quite, quite yeah. important. Yeah. I've had them done by the uh, doctor in clinic, but not in the aspergillosis clinic. When I used to come to one of the respiratory clinics, it was just, you know, a, a, a quick one, but I've had them done in the labs as well. But I have had them done by the doctors just in a clinic visit. Um, we, we've seen Phil demonstrate them as well. And uh, yeah, it did look quite amusing when Phil did it. So uh, uh -huh. yeah. I've had the one in the booth where you go in the booth. That's that's the that's the one I'm talking about, where you go in the booth in a booth yeah. and the technician is outside instructing you um that is the most difficult one i think mm. celia mm. and i was told by the one that got good reading off me in the other results and he said to me your reward today is you do not have to go in the booth <laughs> <laughs> so i must i must say yeah. i'd do anything rather than go in that booth because the you know, pushing against you with the yeah. oxygen. Yeah, I, yeah. I found, oh, so claustrophobic. Um, so I tell you, it really made me 
step up to the mark and do my utmost now. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then again, like on the previous slide, I don't really know what FEV1, etc. is. Ah. Over to Beth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I thought it would be useful rather than just kind of throwing information at you because sometimes that is yeah, hard to take stuff in. Um, I thought, can anybody here tell me what FEV1? Firstly, what it's yeah, just what it stands for, what it what it is, and yeah. bonus points if you can say why it's important. No idea. There you go. Oh. Do with the volume, yes, yeah, it's volume. Yes. That's the registration number of my first car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. So, um, I've got a graph here, and oh, I'll, so I've, get the, I've put the link to this at the end. It's from bronchiopsis.org.net, one or the other. So, um, if you have. Like it looks like there's a lot going on, but I'm going to just walk you through it. So don't don't worry. I'll I'll tell you what all the different bits mean. So the the axis along the bottom is time. So that's just um it's just in seconds. So at the start of the experiment on the left, you can see the um that's called tidal breathing because it's like just in and out gently, just like natural breathing, like the tide rolling in and rolling out very colourful language and then you see this big peak that's you do your big breath in and then you uh, push out as much air as you can as hard as you can you all right Graham sorry didn't really <laughs> turning me turning my I, I'm not sure okay um yeah so you take your big breath in and then you blow out as hard and as fast as you can for as long as you can and that's you can see it goes right the way down and then kind of tails off and that's that's when you can't you can't blow out anymore sorry does that does that make sense so far yes okay cool yeah so, so the fev1 is after a second yeah so yeah. occasionally you you might see fev and then a different number so fev6 and that just means how how much you can blow out in six seconds it's just the number mm. of seconds so um so the force forced expiratory volume is like the blow as hard as you possibly can oh. um, and so then... i've just i've just made something up for fev so it's um flow evaluation volume close uh what one out of three one out of three so it's forced expiratory volume because one of the, yeah, because depending on what the doctor thinks might be wrong with you, um, yeah. there might be a difference between like your forced, like forced blowing out and yeah. gentle blowing out. There can be a difference. Yeah. So people with COPD, um, they might be able to blow out plenty of air, but it takes them longer. It, they're just it's the slow um, expiratory volume. Whereas the yep. force is pudgy cam. Um, so, and the, uh, the, bit, the bit at the bottom where it says RV in red, that's um, your residual volume. So when you've blown out as much air as you actually can, there will still be a mm -hmm. bit of air sort of in the very ends of your lungs that you can't, you can't, blow, you can't blow it out. Um, but that's okay. That's not something they. Did, could you just tell us uh, the RV? How? What percentage is that in a normal person of your lung capacity? You see what I mean? Maybe about five percent. I'm not okay. sure. Right. I don't. Yeah. It's. I. I don't think it's a lot. I don't think it's much. It's just. They just. It's just to acknowledge that. There's a little bit left in there. There's always, it. yeah. There's always got to be some left in. Yeah, yeah, right. and that's and that's okay. But that's it. It's not something that affects this test at all. Um, so one of the doctors are doctors are great ones for they'll they'll measure 
something like this, like one line, and then they'll measure all the different angles and slopes and then ratios of what's this slope to that bit and dividing numbers by each other. And sometimes it can get quite convoluted or, you know, you, you know when you have your, um, an ECG, when you have your heart measured and they're, measure it, they're measuring 10 different bits of one slope and dividing everything by everything else. And you're like, I don't even know what you're doing. Um, it's not as complicated with lungs, thankfully. So the big one that is often measured is the FEV one. So like how fast you can blow out divided by the FVC, um, which, which is the forced vital capacity, which just means how much basically. So if you think of FEV one as being how fast and FVC as being how much, so what they look at is um, they compare, they, they basically they're comparing you against um, like a population of normal, like healthy, <laughs> healthy people of a similar age. And then they look at which, what aspects of your breath are different. So it tends to be with, um, they look, they call it obstruction versus uh, restriction. So say with COPD, Obviously, the O stands for obstructed. So the, um, that it's not necessarily a problem with the lung volume. It's a problem with how obstructed the airways are. So um, I'll just show you. Somebody came up with a really nice analogy for it that I think really works. When you think about mm. a traffic jam on a motorway, when you think about like how 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 much cars are coming through um if you think about so obstruction would be like if you've got two lanes closed but um that would be obstruction whereas if you didn't have many cars that would be restriction so mm -hmm. you're trying to get all of these cars through like maybe a narrower space and it takes you longer like you've, you, they'll all still get through, but it will take it will take all damn day. So that's just that's just just a way of of visualizing it. So, so it's rather like um, uh, an asthma attack if, because your airways are smaller, you can't get the air up and down as fast. Um, so it's a measure of that, really. Yeah. Whereas something like um, like. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis that's very much that's restriction that's your your chest volume is just smaller like the amount of air you can take in is just less um, so those the uh, the numbers the FEV1 and the FVC depending how different they are related to each other that tells the doctor a lot it's really useful for diagnosis because um, it can tell you which type of problem you've got whether it's obstruction or restriction um, so obviously like this uh you get um that that's like the diagnosis part is one sort of set of tests and you might also do um reversibility i don't know if anyone's done this so it's a, a check for um asthma so it's you don't take your medications for a couple of days then they measure you natural then they give you um like inhale some Ventolin for a minute or two, and then they measure you again. And if the difference with or without the Ventolin is above a certain amount, so it's 12% um, and at least 200 mils. So like maybe about that, a little bit less than that. Mm -hmm. um, in either of those measures, then that would mean asthma. Um, so that, that's one I did. The Something that came up a lot in the ELF survey is a lot of people are not feeling that the instructions they're given beforehand about when what medication to stop taking a lot of people are feeling like they're not quite sure like did they get either they got told something verbally and they don't remember or they sort of didn't get told at all um I don't know if has anybody been finding that or do you normally have, do you normally get quite clear just a letter? Um, to me. <clears throat> okay. 
it's just it's just something um yeah where uh, i think it, i think that bit was aimed more at um the doctor's surgeries rather than uh, rather than the patients just get making sure they're clear um, so the upshot of it was, um, yeah, if you're not, if you're not sure if you need to say, stop taking any medications, you might just need to call the reception and just get it clarified. Um, because if you, if you do it wrong, it can mess up the results. Um, so if, if and if you get to the appointment and you realize you haven't done it right, um, be really clear with the technician that like it's in back like um I, I've actually done this myself so I can't judge anybody else for this um I had to go for an asthma test and I completely forgot about stopping my inhalers yeah. beforehand and I was so embarrassed when I the woman said the nurse said if you stop taking your inhalers for a couple of days I said oh, no sorry I forgot felt like a complete lemon um mm. But it's it's really important not to let that embarrassment um, be too much. You, yeah, they, they, they need to know. Um, and also anybody who smokes who might be listening, um, it's good to lay off for a good 24 hours before the test. Like quitting's hard, but if you can just if you can hold if you can hold it off for these 24 hours, it is important. Um, and don't feel awkward or shy about um, asking questions. Like, yes, clinicians are busy. <laughs> not every not everybody has the best manner and comes across as very patient. Mm. But ultimately, <coughs> if their bedside manner isn't quite right, um, that's on them. And if you've got questions, yeah. they need to oh, answer. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's it's because it's awful to come away thinking what just happened um, um so Beth, is the fev score the one then where you are blowing out and blowing out and blowing out that measures the fev does it so that test measures both things um so in the first second it measures your fev and yes. then the kind of long drawn out yes. bit measures the fv thing and that's why you have to keep blowing out to get that yeah. as an accurate score. Yeah, and it's yeah. the ratio between them. Yes, between the two. Yeah, and if, like, yeah, if, I, I don't know how many patients actually don't try hard. I mean, that sounds maybe like a bit of a myth to me, but I think with doctors, there is a lot of anxiety about what if they're not trying hard enough and the result's wrong, they really worry about it. Mm. Um, so you could even say something like, don't worry, I will try 100% here. I don't know. I, I, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you need to sit and catch your breath, then you need to sit and catch your breath and they will just have to wait because you're the one with the cough, not them. And if if you're having difficulty, they're just going to, they just have to, suck it up really um they may not they might might be impatient they may not like it but they have to just let you breathe if you need a second or like if you need i don't know if some of them are standing or yeah if, if you need a moment you need a moment and it's they're your results so you're entitled to ask for them but only if you want them like you might if, if you prefer just to just think this is a load of hassle, I'll just let them interpret it and give me the upshot. That's totally valid as well. Um, what I would say is don't, I wouldn't start comparing numbers to other people because it's something that's very, very unique to the person. So it's not something that you could easily sort of compare notes with other people in the group or kind of look up, oh, what should it be? It's not one of those types of tests. And so actually I'm not going to go into I'm not going to go into today sort of all the ramifications for what it means for aspergillosis because it's actually it is quite it's a bit complicated so it depends on what's your underlying condition whether it's COPD or asthma um, have you got bronchiectasis is it CPA or e ABPA 
it depends on a lot of things. So don't get too hung up on it. But if you're interested, it's okay to ask. And also to ask for an explanation. Because um, I think sometimes doctors think, oh, I'll just give them pills that they need. That's fine, that's all I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want, if you want to know more, um, you, usually if you ask doctors about technical stuff, they'll go on all day. So if you would like to know a bit more information, um, there is a guide by bronchiexis.com, which is where I got that graph from, um, which is a nice written explanation. Um, there's also an explanation just of FEV1, because it's kind of, it sounds simple when somebody's explaining it, and then three weeks later you think, I don't remember what, I don't remember any of that. So <laughs> if you want to refer back, there's a really good resource, it's online, it's called Stat Pearls, and it's a little on the, it's not aimed at patients, it's a little on the technical side, but I think like for sort of expert patients like you guys, I think it's absolutely appropriate and it's very reliable. Um, so it's kind of compiled like lots of doctors get together to get it written just, just so. Um, but some people might find it's a bit too much detail. You, you can have a look, see what you think. Um, there's a video about how to do the tests and a little bit about what the results mean by Oxford Medical Education, which is quite a good source. Um, and that's just a link to YouTube there. Um, and that does, I think that covers peak flow meters as well. Because you kind, of, you kind of think, well, is peak flow meter, is that the same as spirometry? Like, why am I doing different tests, whatever? So those are, those are just three three things you, you can look at. Would people find it in, would, find it, would people find it use, ah, stop sharing yet. Would you find it useful? You know how we did a couple of sessions with Phil about breathlessness and exercise. Do you think you would find it useful to have a session a bit like that with, with them going through spirometry? Oh, only oh, Phil did it. <laughs> I'll tell him that, he'll be pleased. <laughs> he did do it at one of the meetings we had. He went a very nice red colour. Yeah, struggles. Excellent. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's quite dreadful, it, isn't it, when you see them struggling as well. Can I ask um, Christine's husband or partner, I'm sorry, uh, um, when you did your spirometry test, the difficulty of, of when they place something firm in your mouth, like a, a mouth guard, mm. and you have to, that always used to, I don't know what it's called, but that actual test that they did then, the timing was really important or something as well. Um, and that's the one I found really difficult in the, in the hospital with the not so accurate, uh, friendly nurse. Did, did, you know, it was, oh, we've got to do that one again. Oh, we've got to do the whole thing again. Uh, uh, you know, and, and you try your bloody, oh, excuse me, sorry. You try <laughs> your damnest. You try and your, try and your damnest because you've got this like a Wallace and Gromit smile and this piece of apparatus in your mouth. And I think you have to do an inhale and an out, out breath as well onto it. I, did, I didn't find any of the tests particularly easy. Oh, uh, not I, just me then, God bless no, you. No, I, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> Uh, well, I had the, the first time I had it, I was on the ward and I, oh. walked, I, I walked down to lung function for the test. Right. But I put that much effort in, they had to have a wheelchair to get me back. Oh dear. Yeah, oh. I, was, I was quite, yeah. I was quite, oh, I was yeah. exhausted. Yeah. And they were, I don't know, there was, there must have been out, more than half a dozen uh desk that i went to from one to the other 
And mm. I thought that was a bit much. I think that he should have just concentrated on one test or a, or two. Mm. Yeah. I did about half a dozen tests. Yeah, me too, yes, it was, it was, yes. Very lengthy, both, and both it, times. Yeah, it took about an hour and a half. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was exhausted at the end. Mm. Uh, mm. But And as for the results, that they probably wouldn't have meant much to me anyway, I don't think. Mm. No. Uh, yeah. To me, it, it was sort of immaterial as to what the, re, the actual results were. Yeah, I um, I can only. But it was a, it was a day out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a break from the ward, but I mean, on the the one that I sort of sailed through, I was so so ill. Um, but on the ones that. They couldn't get the readings from me at the other hospital. I, I'd walked in, you know. I was I was on my feet, you know, so to speak. Um, so I do do think it's down to the technicians' knowledge and ability to know what this patient is capable of. Or I'm not sure. Yeah, I can sympathise with what you went through because it's not nice. I think it's it's not being made to feel guilty. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Thank you. Know, you. It, yeah. It, it, suddenly, you think you're doing your best. Yeah. But, but then you're feeling guilty because oh, you gosh. haven't performed to a level that's mm. expected. You've reminded um, me of that emotion. Yeah. You're yeah, absolutely right. Mm. I think as far as the result, you know, when you go to clinic and the doctor gives you results or if he mentions it even, what I found is it's usually a generalisation. They say, oh, yeah, it's it's as good as it was last time or it's, it's good considering the way your lungs are. You know, oh. it's all a generalisation. It's never been anything specific. No. Like what? you can get with your blood results they just generalize it is harder to interpret and and sort of summarize yes yeah but like you said beth they are your tests <coughs> you know they are it is relevant it is i mean for me i want to know everything you know um yeah it's a confidence thing, though, isn't it? One to ask, then to be told and to suddenly think, well, I don't know what that means. So therefore, I have the confidence to say, oh, OK, is that good, bad? What does mm. it mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, yeah. yeah. Well, I would have thought, I was always told to be proactive in my care, you know. But and then the same doctor would say you know well you don't really know you know don't worry about that so, yeah an opinion like doctors have such like they're all humans they've got like their different personalities oh, yeah. and different yeah, opinions yeah, and stuff yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know no, you're yeah. never gonna get to, yeah. ask two doctors get three opinions yeah i'm sure i'm sure um that you know the up against time all the time, isn't it? You know, pressure yeah. of work and time. So one day they will feel more relaxed and be able to talk to you. But yeah, it's all taken into account. Don't worry. I do understand. Yeah. And I think sometimes there is definitely a concern that if they start giving out exact numbers to people, that people are going to go home and start asking Dr. Google about this and that. I think oh, a lot yeah. of doctors are just really terrified of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I'd, I'd probably do that. If I was given figures for something, I'd memorise those and then come home and just, like you say, Google it. I, I do. <laughs> I definitely do. <clears throat> Okay, now that everyone's blood pressure's gone up, thinking about upsetting incidents, shall we have some chill out 
relaxation with stretching time. Chris, if you would like to unmute yourself. Good to go. Right, so all this talk of lung volume and uh, residual air, I want to clean that residual air and make it good again. <coughs> and I know some of you are super excited about this. Um, <laughs> rumor, has, rumor has it. Okay, so make <laughs> yourself nice and comfortable. Remember, only do what you can do. Don't overstretch or do anything that you don't want to do. Uh, for those of you that are sat closely together, please don't knock one another out. And sure. um, from those of you that shouldn't be doing any, please take care. You know who they are. Okay, I'm going to start off. Nice deep breath. Really get that breath in and make sure you feel your tummy go out. Get lots of air down there. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, really enjoy that. And enjoy the, the moment of getting the air in and, you know, relaxing. And when you're ready, we'll start with our head as we always do. Get these neck muscles nice and loose. So chin to chest, stretch the neck muscles as far as you can, that chin right down and slowly, and keep your eyes open when you're doing this. Don't want to lose your cells. Take it to the back and check that ceiling out. See if it still needs painting, check it goes. To your chin again. And it's good for these next muscles and it also just reach out to your shoulders to some degree. Back again and back to face the front. From here again keeping your eyes open turn as far around to the left as you can <laughs> and to the right. Anyone got any creaking bones left again? I'll see that I've got there. And right. <laughs> if you feel comfortable, try and do some circular movements. I actually don't like this one, if I'm perfectly honest, because I can hear my neck bones creaking and going. <laughs> so, so only if you feel comfortable, do some nice circular movements. I do do them, but I just don't enjoy them. Um, <laughs> but they, it all strengthens these neck muscles, and that's where all our tension is. So it's quite useful to do this from time to time. I think we're so prone to sitting in positions we forget all these little muscles. Okay. Okay, when you're ready now then, arms to the front. Stretch up to the top if you can. I was going to say down to the side, but I'm worried about Chris knocking Doug out, so I'll, I'll miss that oh, one. please. Yeah, <laughs> down to the middle again, but this time, Turn your palms over and bring it to your shoulders. Slightly out without knocking anyone out and then just do some circular movements on your shoulders. Oh. So we do half a dozen round to the back. Stretch them round as, as much as you can. That's it. And then stop and go the other way. Round. Yeah, you know, yeah. Seen, not all out. grinding noise with your yeah. neck. Yeah, <laughs> your shoulders go. Right shoulders. Okay, so just like we've done the shoulders, let's not forget our hands and wrists because we take for granted picking shopping bags and things. So again, clench your fingers, all those little tendons, stretch them out, and clench again, and stretch out, and then do some wrist circular movements outwards. Yeah, and inwards. Okay, forwards and backwards. Yeah, and the same oh. with your elbows now. Forwards, down, backwards. Yeah, keep that's it. Nice. Okay, hands on your knees. Let's have another deep breath. Fifteen minutes to go. Yeah. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Extra long version today, just for you. Oh, I've got a nice little, we've got a nice little trick for you at the end. So, um, okay, the jog around the block. After yeah, this. yeah. Uh, so, so right knee hug. Bring your knee up as far as you can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm checking on the screen to see if I can see knees. Up again, left, left knee. 
<laughs> okay, feet to the floor. Now, just get yourself nice and straight. Yeah, try and stretch that spine out. Imagine there's a piece of string on your head, and then as if someone's pulling that string, pulling you up. So really stretch that spine out. Yeah, and your, your hips are nicely in position. Um, so we'll warm up our ankles, and then I'll I'll finish off on a little journey. Okay. Right, right foot. Put your foot on the ball of your foot. Make sure you're comfortable and safe, and just rotate the ball of your foot so that your ankles turning round to the right. Yeah. And oh. then uh, turn it inward again. Same movement. So just loosen the ankle. Something just cracked. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's doing something then, isn't it? With its realigning your ankle joint. <laughs> <laughs> now to your left on the ball of your foot again. Circular, circular movement. The best laugh I've had all week, this. Yeah. <laughs> doing them muscles as well. <laughs> and circular it inwards, or whichever way you've gone. Collect your bones, yeah. Okay, now I only want you to do this if you're safe. Put your hands on your cushion or your chair, wherever you can just grip, yeah? And you're going to now pretend to ride a bike. So you're gonna lift your feet from the floor, just tiny little bit, you don't need to move it far right. off. But now you're gonna just ride that bike, yeah? So you're gonna go like that. Oh, yeah, what bike are you? Sort of than it. Yeah, you're harder than it looks, yeah? <laughs> Right, and then feet down to the floor. And one more time, we're gonna do it in reverse. We're riding backwards now, ready? Yeah. Dog's just going like this, really, I'm a dog. Yeah. You know My what? wife can't even ride a bike. Can't ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets these thigh muscles, you see. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we're just going to wheel Graham back to his desk now because he's <laughs> 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 lunch now. <laughs> okay, uh, just raise your legs out to the front, yeah. Bend your for feet forwards and backwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wheel out the way. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> way. Just knock me out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and feet to the floor. Okay. Okay, let's do one last breathing set. I think that. That bike ride really knocked us for six. So that's quite easy to do in your own home that you can just, you can sit on your hands and do it or hold on and you know, but it really gets the blood flowing into your legs right down to your feet. So I think it's it's definitely worth doing. Graham's not too sure. Yeah, sure. Well. yeah, yeah, well of course you've got to hold your, your muscles there, haven't you? Yeah. Which is, you know, because as you're doing that, it's these lower abdominals that are supporting that, isn't it? Okay, so nice and relaxed now. A couple of deep breaths. And remember to do this, give yourself that headspace. Remember what I always say, you know, find a quiet room, just look out the window, the furthest point you can see, you know, whatever you can see there and, you know, use this time to just breathe nicely and, and relax your muscles. Trust me, five minutes of that away in your own little world will, will pay dividend. So as we always do, hands over, cross over and give yourself a hug and look after yourselves. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That bike ride, I think it's really good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> don't have to go anywhere, you see. You don't need to go out the house. You just sit there going like that. <laughs> Okie doke. Hope everyone keeps well. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have done? Yeah, that's Thank it. You. All your moaning, you see. We're done now. <laughs> oh, Chris. Yeah? Um, I, I, could you write me a short bio for yourself? Yeah, uh, I know. You know, you're on cancer now, <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving it some thought, but yes, I will. Yeah. Cool. Because if I, I, it's the kind of thing I don't want to write for somebody else. Because if I get it wrong, you could be like, "Why do you think?" I'm going to write on that. Left. I'll write it. Yeah, I will. 
I will. Cool. Have awesome. It. Thanks. I need to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All, all have right. a good weekend yes, and what, 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 when is the next meeting or have you decided yet um, the, the uh, second I think of July okay. yes, second of July second of thank July. you very much everyone yeah. thank I'll you. emphasize the next thank one a bit you. I'll be more organised next time okay. bye 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 bye, bye. 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 Leave. Leave. While we're on exercise, listening to the radio this morning, they found a prolonged uh, they found a link between prolonged intensive exercise and motor neuron disease. Yeah. That's why that change if you noticed recently they've been doing a lot of there's a lot of rugby players yes. who've got M and D and they oh, kind of yeah. and and they they're now actually thinking the link's more to do Okay. with the extremes of exercise yeah. rather than yeah. Yeah. rather than yeah. rugby players yeah. because the, the problem is with all with, with everything in it is moderation yeah. that's, but that's the key word no yeah. matter what you're doing you, yeah. you know because my husband's just started going back to gym and he's like oh i feel really good i think i'll go tomorrow so you need to have a day off yeah. you need yeah. to you can't keep doing that it's nice and you feel good about it but eventually I was reading a case, take an injury up or something or yeah i was reading a story about a girl who when the gym reopened after uh after lockdown she went and did a massive yeah, session yeah. on one of the bikes there yeah next day legs are really hurt and can't only a young girl as well like mid-20s can't you know this carried on for a couple of days then she started having dark urine goes goes to NA because she just you know boyfriends laughing at her you know friends are like oh yeah yeah, yeah. Goes, got, uh, nurse says you know you've just got doms you know like muscle soreness mm -hmm. uh, you pleads with the nurse you know please you know this is this just feels so much more than this yeah, here's yeah. a urine sample doctor does blood tests with rhabdomyelo which apparently because then I go down a rabbit hole then apparently is not that uncommon in people who exercise a lot so this week i've been to make a why, yeah, why so do you do all this exercise? yeah and do you know i used to say that because like you say we probably have had episodes of that yeah but because we don't get to we just and we recover and we move on but i got them so i think i might have said it to you graham my sister does zero yeah she'll do anything at all i'll tell you that now but she never complains about <laughs> <laughs> so thinking, she never moans about her knees like I do. She never moans about any aches and pains or they, 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 they did a study years ago. Yeah. Yeah. With microscopic uh, blood in the, the urine after yeah. after marathons. I've had I've had blood in the urine after after a half a half marathon. Yeah. 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 It's not, and you just go, hmm. I know, and yet when you do, because I, I, I think oh, my knees are shot, I can't tell you. And and then I watch my husband, do, who, as I say, he's got to 62 and he's only yeah. just started going to the gym. He used to do a bit in the garage, but we could, uh, my daughter and I used to count. He would say, I'm going in the garage to do something, and we'd go, uh, 10, 9, 8, and the next thing, the door would come down, he'd be, you know, in and out like a flash. But he has started going to the gym. But then he'd be doing all these, you know, presses and all that. Yeah. And I think, I'd be in agony if I did that. My knees would not support me. And I thought, who, who's right was, and who's wrong? And I'll say to, 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 to Graham. Graham. Yeah. I was saying to Graham, I said, I've not ran on the road for, for getting on, well, over six weeks. But I've been doing loads of the gym, like strength yeah, stuff before, yeah, yeah, yeah. and light treadmill. Yeah, yeah. Which I've never really focused on that much no, before. No, no, no. And it went out and knocked two minutes off the yeah, yeah, five yeah, yeah. so yeah. clearly it, it does actually work. It yeah. does work. I have done stretch stuff in the past. Yeah. Before, before it's it important, is, yeah. though, because it's important to balance and everything. Well, I've, I've, I've hit a destroyed man. It's gone. <laughs> just, just gone. I've got, got a diastasis mm -hmm. recti. I can get my fingers in. It's just <laughs> in the abdomen where the, the muscles won't come back and it killed me. Oh. It's not, I do not sell having children. <laughs> Take a couple of from no, there. It's difficult, yeah. difficult to find reasons to do it. Really. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. oh, now I'm oh. <laughs> Don't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Oh. Got to get to the canteen yet. <laughs>